let's get into a case to, to apply what we've been talking about. So this is a case right out of my office from the last two weeks. Um, this is a male police officer, 46 years old, who is in process with me and had no neurologic symptoms when we started. Okay, so he had no neurologic complaints. We've been in process of getting labs and things for him, and then he's developed peripheral neuropathy, which peripheral neuropathy, if you're not um, familiar with, is like numbness, tingling, weakness, shocks, that's it's nerve, nerve symptoms in the periphery. So arms, legs, you know, torso, you could have them anywhere in the peripheral nervous system. And specific to this person, they started with sh what he, he called, you know, shocks going from his brain to his sinuses and then have developed into uh, shooting nerve, nerve pain down his arms on both sides. So let's dive into it. So we had, we had been in process, no sign of this, and then he sends me this email. He sent it on the 25th, and he's, I'll read it to you. It says, on the 17th at 4.30 in the morning, I was awakened in the middle of the night with a rapid heartbeat and what I call electric shocks through my body. Weird tingling in my hands and arms too. I've never ever experienced that before. I also thought I was going to faint. I had my wife call the medic because I thought I was having a heart attack. Again, I've never called a medic in my life. By the time they came out, the shocks and heart palps already had subsided. My blood pressure was 130 over 84 and I had a normal EKG. They said it could be a panic attack. Again, never have had a panic attack before. To note, the night before, I had about four drinks with friends at the house and did not eat well. I also trained heavy on the day before that with leg press. Not sure if these had anything to do with it, but wanted to let you know. So out of nowhere, this, this man starts experiencing these neurologic symptoms. So he didn't have lab workup at this time, but he had run labs for me uh, a couple weeks earlier and we were waiting for his final labs to come in so we could sit down and talk about them. But because he had these symptoms, he, he asked me to, you know, is there anything from the labs you can tell me ahead of time that we can start working on today that might impact this or explain this? So I pulled up his labs and here's what we could see that appeared relevant to those complaints. So at the top, you can see immediately he had uh, what appears to be iron overload. So lab high iron and lab high iron saturation. And we've made, I, I've made videos on my YouTube channel previously about iron overload. And we did one recently, a call recently about iron overload and anxiety and how iron overload in the brain can promote things from anxiety to depression to neurodegeneration to schizophrenia. So panic attacks could potentially be driven by high iron. So that's potentially relevant. Then if you go down to the next frame, you see homocysteine is elevated. Well, homocysteine is the end product of the methylation cycle that we described earlier with all those B vitamins involved in the genes. When those gears turn, when you turn a gene on or off, you're creating homocysteine as a metabolite. And if homocysteine builds up, that drives oxidative stress and can create brain inflammation or excitotoxicity, like we talked about last week in the magnesium and neurologic disorders video. So we need to turn those gears efficiently to recycle the homocysteine so it's not building up and driving anxiety or depression or brain fog or headache. So um, that's key. And remember that process requires B vitamins. Moving down, you can see lab high MCV and RDW. Those markers are indicators of the size of his red blood cells. The bigger your red blood cells are, the more immature they are. Immature red blood cells require B vitamins and iron to mature into lean mean red blood cells. Well, you can see above, he's not lacking iron. He actually has too much. So it's, that's not why he has big red blood cells. So it must be B vitamins. So that would be an indicator for us to investigate B vitamin deficiency 
further. And so if you look down in the green box, we looked at B12 and B6 markers. Methylmalonic acid is the best marker for, for B12 level. It's far better marker than serum B12. And it's an inverse marker, meaning if it's lab high, you're actually deficient in B12. So his is lab high, he's B12 deficient. B12 is key in the methylation cycle. The B6 markers are the same way. If they're lab high, he's lab low or deficient in B6. So one of them is lab high showing deficiency, the other one's functionally high, again, suggesting insufficiency if not deficiency. So these labs tell us, hey, you're deficient in B6, I told, or in B vitamins. I told him he was deficient. I suggested he pick up a few things and start taking them to help with this while we continue to figure out more. And we also wanted to avoid increasing his iron. So what happened? Well, in the meantime, he went for his medical doctor, uh, ordered a brain and spine MRI because of the peripheral neuropathy to try and understand if there were central causes to it. And both of those were normal. The only finding was on the spinal MRI. Uh, there's a, a, a herniation in the C5, C6 area of the neck on the left that was compressing the cord. So that could help explain uh, some of the symptoms potentially down the left arm, but not both arms necessarily. So we wanna look for a more systemic cause. So then I received this email a couple of days ago that his medical doctor ran vitamin B6 in the blood. And as you can see, it's lab high there by about three, three X or three times. And so they diagnosed him with vitamin B6 toxicity and blamed the peripheral neuropathy on B6 toxicity. So he emailed me to say, doc, they're saying I have B6 toxicity. They're telling me to stop taking B vitamins. Um, what do you think I should do? So I constructed this email back to him to help him understand what we've been talking about tonight. And then it actually happens to tie up a bunch of tonight's conversation for us. So here it is. A, or number one, B vitamins are water soluble meaning they're quickly excreted in the urine, making toxicity difficult without long-term dosing at very high levels. Specific to vitamin B6, because that's what they think he has, they think he's toxic in B6. Research shows that B6 toxicity occurs with doses of 500 milligrams to 1,000 milligrams a day taken for months. There's no evidence in the literature of toxicity at doses of 200 milligrams a day or less. And here's, here's that literature right here not in red, none of the studies had sensory nerve damage at a daily intake below 200 milligrams, okay? And so we'll get back to this, but I just wanted to show you that. Point two, many times serum levels of B vitamins are lab high due to supplementation. Again, these quote lab highs are transient as the B vitamins are typically excreted through the urine quickly. Specifically to B6, after you take a dose orally, blood levels peak within an hour and then drop. So, you know, a lab high blood draw doesn't necessarily mean you're toxic or even sufficient in a given B vitamin because levels may be peaking because you took a supplement recently or recent to the blood draw, okay? Three, it is documented that symptoms of B6 toxicity are the same as B6 deficiency. So that causes an issue. Is he B6 toxic or deficient? The symptoms are the same. So you can't just run a, a poor marker like B, serum B6 and assume toxicity, especially if you haven't asked him, were you taking B, B6 for a long time at high doses? So I said, given the testing we performed that revealed B6 deficiency and the fact that you were taking no B6 supplements before your symptoms started, and the fact that you cannot become B6 toxic from diet alone, because your diet only has about 1.9 micrograms per day in it, it is much more plausible that B6 deficiency is contributing to your case, not toxicity. When B6 toxicity does happen, 
as stated above, it's due to huge doses for months. You haven't been dosing for even one month and you haven't been taking more than 200 milligrams a day. And like we talked about earlier, there's, there's active and inactive forms. You've been taking the active form, pyridoxal 5-phosphate, P5P, not the inactive form, pyridoxin, that is known to inhibit the active form at high doses and cause deficiency symptoms. Lastly, if someone is B6 toxic, the answer is to stop supplementation. And again, given the overwhelming evidence in his case, it's far more likely that he's deficient in having symptoms of deficiency, not toxicity. So we return to this, this research and it says all cases of B6 toxicity are from supratherapeutic dosing or high doses. Middle of the page, you know, it had to, it'd have to be between 500 to 1,000 milligrams per day for months. He was taking none before the symptoms. So that's not happening in his case. And then I put him on about 200 a day divided up. And the studies show that 200 or less per day doesn't drive toxicity and especially wouldn't drive it in the few days that he had been on it before, you know, his doctor ran that B6 test. And then not highlighted, but in the, in the top half of the page, you can see that, excuse me, I misspoke, it's 1.9 milligrams per day in our diet. So you're never gonna become B6 toxic from the diet. So I sent him that and he responded, thank you. The doctor tested me for an MTHFR mutation. I have one or both mutations I haven't heard back yet. But then I got an updated email today, actually, where he said uh, they got the results in and he has two copies of the MTHFR mutation. So I'll, I'll explain more about that in a minute. And so the doctor prescribed him 10 milligrams of methylfolate. So good job by that doctor to give him the methylated version. But they want him to stop taking B6, B complex, B12. Well, that's the myopic medical approach, okay? They're focusing in on one tiny little piece of the picture and ignoring everything else. So if we take his picture right here, here's a more complicated picture of the methylation cycle that we addressed earlier, but it's more complete. So don't, don't freak out, just, just roll with me here because this completes our conversation as well. Remember way back on the left here, you see the Krebs cycle. Okay, that was where we were talking about citrate, succinate, uh, malate, okay, How, where those different forms of vitamins plug in to make energy for us. Well, the red arrows I added to this diagram are places where B vitamins are involved. And so B, all the B vitamins are, are, are involved in the Krebs cycle and energy production. Then middle of the page, you see that MTHFR gene, the, the baby blue box. Remember, we talked about that methylfolate or B9 is key there. And he has two bad copies or two mutations there. We all have two copies. We have one from mom and one from dad. If mom gives us a good and dad gives us a good, we have optimal function. If mom gives us a bad and dad gives us a good or vice versa, then that's a susceptibility for up to a 40% inefficiency there. Not damnation, just susceptibility. If mom and dad both give us a bad copy like he has, then that's a susceptibility to a 70% inefficiency in this gene. Not a damnation, susceptibility. Whether or not it occurs depends on his lifestyle and the epigenetics, right? So he's got two bad copies setting him up for inefficiency. And then if he's, you know, living poorly, then, and not providing you know, methylfolate like he needs, then it's gonna be, he's gonna have issues with methylation and methylation turns genes on and off. And depending on which genes he's not turning on or off correctly, could manifest in a bunch of symptoms. So essentially there, his medical doctor gave him methylfolate, which is good, but that's only addressing that baby blue box there. What about the green boxes that are B12? What about that yellow orangey one that is CBS? That's B6, he needs B6. If he's deficient, that's not happening. And remember B6 deficiency symptoms are the exact same as B6 toxicity. And then those COMT genes, the red ones at the bottom, those require B2 or the riboflavin. So for the doctor to tell him, stop all the Bs except for methylfolate, well, 
what sense does it make to give him methylfolate and try and turn that wheel and pull out all the rest and stop the wheel immediately because all those other enzymes don't have the nutrient cofactors they need. So he needs all the bees, right? We all need all the bees, but he needs all the bees because his case is screaming deficiency, not toxicity. And again, this, this is, this is a problem of his, his doctor not understanding the whole physiologic process, not doing a good history that I can tell and asking, hey, were you taking high doses of B6 for months before you came in here? Because if he wasn't, then you can't diagnose B6 toxicity. That's not it. Even if his serum B6, which is a poor marker, is lab high, you'd rather run the organic acids to see it like we did and see the xanthurinate and kynurinate high, which means deficiency and he's got B6 deficiency. So if your brain isn't exploded by this point, then you probably have a future as a health detective, and I encourage you to pursue that. Um, if it is exploded, no worries. This is a, a ton of information and jargon you've probably never heard before, but hopefully you learned a lot and it opened your eyes and gave you some actionable things when understanding and, and choosing supplementation. And if you like the detective approach that I just presented, then my best-selling book on Amazon is available where I walk you through uh, 10 different or more than 10 different patient cases with different autoimmune diseases to help you understand autoimmune disease and ways to impact that in a positive way.